Diane, can you, can you address those two points? First, do you agree that it is a, a crisis or an emergency for the country? And secondly, do you think we really have learned a lot in the last few years via the charter school experience specifically about how to, how to address some of these problems? Let me see if I can remember both your questions. I'm turning 73 on Friday. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the first thing is, I think we have a, I do think we have a crisis of poverty, and poverty is particularly concentrated uh, amongst African Americans, but also there are other groups. Uh, there are plenty of poor whites who, I was talking the other day with Robert Putnam at lunch, the class divide is growing dramatically. Income inequality in this country is growing dramatically. Uh, the shares uh, of, of national income that go to the upper 1% has increased dramatically, and those at the bottom uh, are growing in numbers. And kids, I think, must have a sense of desperation, thinking they can never make it to here. They can, they'll never be invited to uh, Aspen. Or, uh, it, 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 success may seem like an out-of-reach dream. We have, again, from yesterday, somebody said at the Big Ideas Conference, one out of three children born premature will have learning disabilities. Uh, their, their risk of autism increases by 86%. We have a dramatic problem of increasing poverty. When you look at the districts where there is the most dramatically bad academic performance, they are racially isolated with concentrated poverty. And the problem with the charter sector is, I would love to see a high-performing chain like KIPP take over an entire district. The usual complaint, which I've heard many times about KIPP, and I visited KIPP schools, I was in the the mothership school in Houston, I was very impressed with it. But the usual complaint is they're creaming kids, they're skimming, they have a high attrition rate. I don't know if this is true, and I, and I know that there will be people who will say it's not true, they're not creaming, they're not skimming, but there are many charters in this country that have disproportionately tiny numbers of the hardest to educate children. They're not taking in the, right, the same proportion of English language learners, and this has been shown in study after study. They're not taking the children with profound disabilities, and so the neighborhood school where the charters are located get disproportionately large numbers of the hardest to educate children. And then they say, look, we the charter are better than you uh, because look at our test scores and look at yours. Well, they're not educating the same children. So I think uh, a couple of years ago I met with Secretary Duncan and he said, what should I do about Detroit? And you know, of course my first thought was that's a Michigan problem, it's not the Secretary's problem. But, um, um, then I said, why don't you just give Detroit to KIPP and TFA, as if you could, which you couldn't. And he said, don't be ridiculous. Um, but I think that would be a wonderful uh, demonstration of, can you take an entire district, charter the whole district, let TFA, well, but, so but New it. Orleans is like the haves and the have-nots. They're the kids who are making it. This is a two, we're going back in effect to the days of segregation, except that almost all the kids are black. In this case, it's the haves and the have-nots. And the ones who are in the non-charter schools, the charters don't want them because 80% or more of them can't pass the state test. So you're saying, though, that you have enough confidence in KIPP that you would support having it take over an entire urban school district? If, if that school district were to invite them to do so, I'd love to see them try it. I think it would be a wonderful way to answer the question which always comes up, are you skimming, are you winning by attrition? So, I mean, the, the thing I would say is, so, so maybe, maybe we are making progress here because you know, I, I guess my, my main belief in this is, okay, we've learned something in 20 years, which is not how to fix the whole system yet, but we have learned that it is truly possible to provide kids growing up in poverty with an education that is transformational for them. We know how to do it, we know how to replicate it. Now we can get to a very different question than the one that, has, that certainly was dominating the discussion in, in these first two decades, which is, Okay, how do we scale it? And there are, I, th I think that's a whole different discussion. And you know, maybe one idea is to give KIPP a school system. There, there are other ideas I, I might propagate. I, um, I mean, so here's what I believe. Like as we consider the question, you know, what is it gonna take to fix the system? If you look at the experience of the last 20 years, there's some really depressing information and, and some really interesting information. The depressing information is that despite billions of dollars of philanthropy and lots of committed political leaders, in an aggregate sense, we have not moved the needle against the problem. The encouraging, interesting information is that some systems are moving the needle in ways that are truly meaningful for kids. Again, early days. We do not yet have the proof point, so this is gonna end up being a long di discussion, but 
you know, we can't yet point to a system that's making it happen for all kids. Um, but, but, but I think it's fascinating to look at. So what's happening differently in the communities that have started to make meaningful progress? And, you know, my belief, based on everything I've seen, is that the policymakers and the, the educational leaders and the kind of constellation of folks in and around the reforms in, in these communities that are making a real difference are grounding their steps in the lessons that can be learned in these high-performing schools. So they're not doing what we often do nationally. They're not lurching from one silver bullet solution to another. They are assuming that, so, so we have to sort of go into these schools to, to really understand what, what we need to do at a system level. And I think if we do that, we realize, okay, so these schools have embraced a different mandate than most schools in America and around the world embrace. Like they actually set out to change their kids' trajectory. They determine we are going to put our kids on a path to have the option to get to and through college. We are going to personally commit ourselves, this is the school leader thinking, to ensuring that our kids gain the academic skills and the character strength necessary to have that option. Now that's a very ambitious goal. It's insanely ambitious, to Diane's point. It's rarely been done. So they go after it with a level of energy, a level of discipline, using the same strategies that great leaders use to go after any really ambitious goal. They focus first and foremost on building a, power, a, a strong team. They are obsessive about who they recruit into their classrooms, about developing them over time, about you know, it, just everything as it relates to the, the, the quality of the folks in that building and their effectiveness. They intentionally work with their staff to build a powerful culture of achievement. Just like great leaders build powerful cultures, they build cultures that are so strong they'll align the kids, the families, and the teachers all on that same mission. They manage aggressively and they do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to get to this goal, they're gonna do. If it takes lengthening the school day and lengthening the school year, they're gonna do it. If they need to bring in health services, mental services, health services, et cetera, into their schools, they will make it happen. So they basically redefine schools and then go at it, you know, w with all of that. And so, like, what are the lessons here? Like, how are we ever gonna scale that? And, and I think two big things emerge when you spend time in lots of these schools. First is, we've gotta figure out a way to empower and trust, hold responsible our school principals for attaining certain outcomes. We need to give them all the flexibility they need to, you know, to, do, to operate like these very successful school leaders do. In other words, we need to move from what we have today, which is a, a compliance culture driven by a set of rules and regulations that have been created by policymakers at every level who do not trust our educators, well-intentioned people, they care about the kids, they don't really believe the teachers or the principals or the districts will do the right thing, and so they've tried to micromanage them. And the result is a bunch of teachers and principals and others who actually start believing, because it's very hard to think clearly when you're in a powerful culture, that their job is to tick the boxes. You walk into these schools and you realize, oh, these are not people going through a process. These are people on a mission to get to a different outcome. So that's one thing we gotta do, move from compliance culture to an accountability culture. Another thing you realize is, we will never get there without an amazingly massive investment in the people capacity of the system. Like, you know, in the way that high performing organizations anywhere invest in recruiting and developing their people over time, we desperately need to do that. You can't find one of these schools without an incredible school leader. 